Hello, and you are all very welcome to Goldcore's webinar. As this is an open Q&A session, it is your questions that have driven the agenda. We received over 250 questions ahead of the webinar today, and one subject that keeps cropping up is that of safety of silver deposits, be they held in person or by trusted third parties. I want to bring your attention that Goldcore offer allocated accounts with all major depositories in the US, with the Perth Mint, and with Viamat. Allocated accounts stored with Viamat in the tax-free zone in Zurich Airport, Switzerland, are probably the safest place in the world to store gold and silver bullion. My name is Michael O'Brien. I'm the Marketing and Communications Manager here at Goldcore, and I'll be your moderator today. First up is David Morgan. David, a precious metals aficionado, created the SilverInvestor.com website and originated the Morgan Report, a monthly that covers economic news, overall financial health of the global economy, currency problems, and the key reasons for investing in precious metals. As publisher of the Morgan Report, he has appeared on CNBC, Fox Business, and BNN in Canada. He has been interviewed by the Wall Street Journal, Futures Magazine, The Global Report, and numerous other publications. I'm going to hand you now over to David, and I'm going to allocate the um, mouse and screen to him. Very good. Well, welcome, everyone. And this is going to be um, a bit of a trial for me from the aspect that, as uh, <clears throat> Michael said, there were over 200 questions. And they have been categorized, taking some of them, obviously, were duplicates. But uh, to cover some of these questions in depth is impossible. And because of that, and my desire to educate, I'm going to do my best to maybe do a top to you on some of these. I do want to remind everyone that we I'm very happy to do these from time to time for free, but there is a paid service. It's called the Morgan Report. There are three levels. The basic level, I answer questions, many of which are appearing here uh, in the reports. Sometimes some of the questions actually are the feature of an editorial. And further, if you're on the advanced service, you are allowed to write me uh, your questions, and you can expect an answer, even if the answer is I can't answer it. And those are usually direct stock questions. In other words, I'm not allowed to answer what do you think about XYZ mining. So with that in mind, let me proceed ahead with, um, with this webinar. Silver price rises, records when to sell. When do you see $100 silver more for silver? Uh, I'm on record in early 2000 so, saying that silver make $100 US as a minimum. When is a tougher question to answer. The truth is no one knows for sure, but it will be during the panic manic phase. And that probably is scheduled to be around 2016. Uh, right now, <clears throat> again, no one knows, but most of these bull markets run an average of about 17 years. The bull market in gold started around 2000. That makes 2017. I think it'll be before that. So if you want a number, that's about it. So it's not going to be 2013, probably not 2014. But beyond that, I'll probably see those kind of numbers. When do you think silver reaches peak value, and what is the potential value silver might achieve? I think the peak value, again, will probably be 2016, 17, in that range. And the potential value is not a number of US dollars, although that's certainly how everyone is taught to think. You have to shift your paradigm. What you want to focus on is what the question asks, value of silver. The value of silver is like the value of gold. Uh, everyone has pretty much that's you know been looking at the metals for very long has heard the expression, and it's worn the one, but yet it gives the correct idea that a ounce of gold would buy a fine man's suit. During Roman times, you could get togas, sandals, uh, rope, et cetera, the best of the best for a gold ounce. In uh, the 1920s, you get a men's suit, hat, tie, umbrella, shoes, socks, the whole nine yards were an ounce of gold. Today, that's true as well. So that's the value of gold over a long period of time. Does it fluctuate? Yes. But the idea is that it maintains its value over long periods of time, and that's a marker for the value. Now, if gold gets to be priced where you could buy 25 min suits for an ounce of gold, I would suggest you consider the fact that that means it's overvalued. You're not looking at how many dollars or how many euros or how many whatevers. You're looking at gold versus clothes. And you can apply it gold versus food or gold versus houses or gold versus the Dow Jones. Don't care. You want to look at what the value of it is. Is it overvalued or undervalued or fair value? So that's the idea, and that is uh, where, I, where do I think it'll go? 
Uh, Mike Maloney and I are pretty close. I've known Mike for a long time. He's looking for a one-to-one -one ratio with the Dow Jones Industrial Average. I'm looking at something along those lines. I think that's probably a pretty accurate measurement. So that's the idea I want to give you. When do we know to sell? When we reach those kind of uh, indicators, what indicators you look for, I just outline those. That should take care of the next one. I know I'm going fast, but I have a lot to cover. Uh, what price do you see reaching at its peak if it were to get a 16 to 1 or 10 to 1 ratio? I look at the ratio. So basically, gold, I think, has more analysts on it than silver. If I have said, in, uh, go to the website, um, themorganreport.com, or the same website, silver-investor.com. Go to the archives. Look up an article called Engineering the Price of Gold. It's one of the first ones I wrote. It's way back in the early 2000s. I talk about I expect to see 16 to 1 or even 10 to 1. So if you think gold is going to 3,000 to 3,500, which Jim Sinclair has said many, many times, it was a minimum for him, then a 10 to 1 ratio would imply $350 gold. If you looked at the other ratio, the monetary ratio of 16 to 1, obviously be less than that. I don't think there'll be um, anything but silver beating gold on a ratio basis uh, once this bull market gets restarted. Uh, but nonetheless, I think people should own both, especially depending on their their individual situation. Will silver break the sensitive level of 15, 2013? I doubt it. Uh, from which month, 213, will it rise? Probably this month, but no one knows for sure. We might get a false rally from uh, current you know, March into June, only to fall back into the uh, months. There's so many wild cards out there. It's really, really difficult for me or anyone else to say when uh, everyone wants those answers, myself included. On the advanced service, I let the market show me what it's doing. And based on what the market does, I make my trades. So for example, if the market were to maintain a certain price level for a certain amount of time, uh, then I would establish a position saying the market's telling me it's going higher here. And then I would put a stop in, because I don't know for sure that that's going to hold. And if it does hold, then away you go. I haven't had many trades on, in fact, none this year. So let's see, I've got the next slide. Whoops. Is that the next slide manipulation? OK, so this, that slide, the next slide. When <clears throat> silver prices, why isn't silver rising with the stock market? Yeah, because it isn't. First of all, gold, not gold stocks, but gold is the most negatively correlated asset that exists to the stock market. So when the stock market goes up, gold goes down, and vice versa. Doesn't mean it's 100% of the time. Doesn't mean it's a tick-by-tick -tick basis. It means the most negatively correlated. Silver is 85% correlated to gold, 85%. The only thing that's 100% correlated to gold is gold. So if silver is highly correlated to gold, and it is, and gold is the most negatively correlated asset to the stock market that exists, then common sense or logic would imply that silver would pretty much follow gold. And if the stock market's going up, then gold would go down, and silver so would as well. Can you see silver dipping again below $24 US? Um, Possibly. I mean, I've never said that I know everything about the silver market. I think the 26 and change level will hold. I've done several updates for my paid members on that fact because they are the ones that pay me, which means they get to look at it on a you know tick by tick, count by count basis. I'm exaggerating slightly, but they get to sit down with me at their computer. It's my voice, and I'm going through the charts with them and show them what I expect. Just because I expect these things doesn't necessarily mean I'm correct, but I do give out illustrations on what to do or what to look for. I'm on board with the coming collapse of the dollar. I believe silver is a way to protect my family financially. But when will it be time to sell? I covered that. When the value of silver and gold get to, to overvalued levels, that's the time to start selling. I plan to make a call. I plan to tell my members <clears throat> you know, what I'm doing, what I'm looking at putting my money into, and sell into the rally. In other words, there's not a day that I plan to sell. I, I plan to sell when silver starts to get overvalued. I'm going to probably start to um, allocate out of the metal, and probably will always hold some. But nonetheless, uh, I don't want to hold too long or sell too quickly. That's how I will approach it. I will be approaching it as a sale, not a one-day event. If silver and gold is a real store of value, why is the price of silver still in the doldrums? Uh, this may not please you, but 
bull, the function of a bull market, and you can Google this, and you can read a lot of other opinions. This is mine and some fact, but mostly it's opinion. The function of a bull market is to shake off as many people as possible. If you go back to the last bull market in gold, you would have loved to bought it at the fixed price of 42.22 an ounce. Most people say 35, but we can use 35. And 850, January 21st, 1980. But in that ride, it went to $200, fell back to almost $100, and then from 100 made its way up to the 850 or 875 versus the near month futures contract. So, would you have had the conviction? Well, looking backwards, you would have, because you'd know the future, but none of us do. So this is not untypical of a bull market. It happened in the last one. It's happening again. It doesn't really concern me that much because I only use leverage when I think it's applicable. And I'm smart enough to know the market knows more than any of us. And if I'm wrong in one of my calls, I get stopped out. Now, I do more than trading. I invest for the long term. That's basically what Morgan Report's about. The basic service is all about a buy and hold philosophy. It has nothing to do with trading. It's only advanced level that I do that. And at the advanced level, I never have more than 25% on a trade, and that's not a single trade. That would be multiple trades. Uh, most of the time, it's a small amount allocated for a leverage position that's uh, hopefully going to carry through for a position, meaning it will last several weeks to months. But anyway, I hopefully answered that. Oops, sorry. Um, oh, let's see. So In his well-researched and documented book, The Great Crash, Harry Dan, I've read the book, convincingly projects 12 years of deflation, which has started and we know served and done on prices of all assets, including precious metals and metal. Um, yeah, I've read the book. Uh, in fact, I went through that in extreme depth in the Morgan Report. If you're on the advanced service, you could dig it out. I don't know which month an, an issue it was. It's been several years ago. The main thing to keep in mind is that, one, I'm an Austrian economist, so I really believe, and you can go to Mises.org, M-I-S-E-S dot O-R-G, type in deflation in their search engine and read a bunch about deflation. There's never been a true deflation, which is a contraction in the money supply. We're increasing the money supply at an astronomical level. It's not a function of the amount of dollars printed. It's a function of how fast those dollars are turned over. So yes, we are seeing what's really called stagflation, which now I'm going to contradict my Austrian schooling, because even the really strict Austrians say you can't have what we really have, which is a very high increase in inflation in the money supply and uh, mixed prices out there in the real world. The bottom line is this. One, there's never been a time in recorded history of 5,000 or 6,000 years that a paper system has trumped gold. Never. It never happened. Number two is the research that Jim Poplava did that the only true deflations that ever took place were in a gold-backed system, not in a fiat-only system. So I would urge you to do more research. I'm not urging you to go into the archives on my paid member services uh, and then you know look it up that way. There's lots of arguments out there. But certainly we are in trying time. Certainly I'd say we're in stagflation. And certainly it, it demands paying attention to. Supply and demand. Is there an alternative for silver for industrial use? All kinds of... Uh, alternatives. Uh, for example, uh, CD-ROMs. Um, the really high-end ones that have to have certain performance are silver. Most of them are aluminum. Uh, same thing with a mirror. Real high-end mirror is silver. And a low-grade crummy mirror that you might have in a kid's toy box or uh, with, with a <coughs> function of the mirror isn't really that um, important. You could have aluminum. Might there be an alternative at some point? They're already in my view, and you know, I could be wrong, but almost every place that silver could be squeezed out of the equation, it has been. Uh, all the alternatives have been used. All the alternatives, and so you look at like photovoltaics that have to have some silver. That's been squeezed down as to the barest amount of silver possible. The reason that there can't be a substitute is that silver conducts electricity better than anything known to mankind. Silver also transfers heat at a better rate than anything else. So you have solar, uh, you have electric uh, conductivity, you have heat transfer, um, and there's also biocidal principles where silver can actually uh, kill bacteria that no antibiotic can at this point in time. So there's properties of silver that you can't substitute for. It's like saying you've got a gold medal athlete 
uh, he's the best in the world, set a world's record, and until something else comes along, in other words, you know, something different than silver, another element out there, it's king in some areas, it's in those areas. Do you know if central banks are buying silver like Russia and China and India? I doubt it, uh, knowing what the end game will be. Certainly, I can't give you all the confidentiality thing, even on the aid service, because I have certain non-disclosure agreements that I sign with certain entities and individuals that I cannot disclose. Let me just say that, to the best of my knowledge, no one in the official realm in those three countries are buying silver. Uh, I'll just state it as that. And, and are a thousand ounce bars scarce? No, thousand ounce bars aren't necessarily scarce. There's roughly a billion ounces in thousand ounce bar form, and most of them are held by ETFs. For all practical purposes, almost all thousand ounce bars are now held as investment, but uh, they're not rare relative to um, the you know that's the silver supply, and then of course there's the coin supply, which is also roughly a billion ounces. So the total supply, silver coins and silver commercial bars is roughly 2 billion ounces. Why no central bank demand for silver? Paul, I suggest you get on the website, go in the archives, and read everything written by Charles Savoy. That's Charles, S-A-V-O-I-E. It would take me months to go through everything, but silver has been more of a hit list item than gold, believe it or not. The entire thing about the Wizard of Oz was all about moving the gold standard, only gold, to the banking establishment in the East, depressing silver, the people's money, for more control. Gold is only one step away from a fiat system. Whenever you had a trimetallic system, copper, silver, and gold, you had a more stable system than just gold alone. Uh, that can be proven. I don't have time to, to uh, go into it, but it's something for you to research. A lot of these things, you know, you'll get your best answer when you actually dig it out yourself. I've spent years and years looking at this stuff. Again, I don't know it all, but it's a very good question. Um, manipulation. Which are the methods that could be used to manipulate silver prices? Well, the basic premise of all activity in any market, be it the silver market, be it the stock market, bond market, whatever happens, even the real estate market, happens to the amount of buying pressure or selling pressure that exists. When there's more buying pressure of a commodity or a stock or the housing market goes up, and when there's more selling pressure, the price goes down. I mean, that's just common sense. If you have a great deal of um, whatever, or even if you don't have that much, but there's no demand for it, you have a car and you want to sell it, and no one likes that kind of mo model. They don't like that model. They don't like that year. Uh, you're going to have to discount, 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 and drive the price down, 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 down until you finally find a buyer. Same thing in the market. Now, the reason that it can be done is because all of these markets are so highly leveraged they're all considered commodities, and the commodities or futures markets have vast amounts of leverage to them. So a little bit of buying can move the price much higher than just cash buying would do, and a little bit of selling can move the price much higher than cash selling would do. I hope that's clear. I'm trying to give a, a basic here. So the reason you can manipulate the price is you can come in and make massive buying with a small amount of cash relative to what the bought and paid for cash settlement price would be, and the same thing on the sell side. So a lot of these entities make their money selling and buying. They move both directions or on either side of the market they want to be on to drive the price wherever they want to drive it in relative terms. Uh, I want to be clear here that I do not believe that you can manipulate the overall trend. The overall trend for gold and silver has been up, and I believe it continues to be up, and I believe the uh, continuation of that trend will be here shortly. How are people able to manipulate the price of silver by selling massive amounts of silver on paper that doesn't exist? Who are these people? They are the Working Group on Financial Markets. Type it into Google. The Working Group on Financial Markets, you will find out. It's the uh, president. It's the uh, head of the Security Exchange Commission. It's the head of the Treasury. In other words, it's the elites. The elites of the elites are the financial working group on financial markets. They have at law and in public domain knowledge. You can verify this as the truth, have the ability to manipulate any market they care to. Now, I don't think they use the word manipulate, but they can go in and move these markets around. That's who does it for the most part. Yes, there are banks. Yes, there are hedge funds. Yes, there are others. But when you really get into the big, big market, which is the bond market, primarily the bond market is manipulated by 
the working group on financial markets. The bond market, of course, is the largest market in the world. Why is it? Because it's the debt market. There's more debt in the planet than we can absorb. We're over-indebted as a planet. How long can the Fed bankers continue to manipulate and hold off the run-up of gold and silver? Peter, I wish I knew. I don't think it's too much longer, meaning a couple years at the most, but um, I could be wrong there. And I think what you could see is what we already have witnessed. So history is a great teacher. And what we saw in the financial panic of 2008 was two silver prices and two gold prices. The honest to God gold and silver price where you had to put down X amount of cash to buy it and the futures price, which is substantially less than the real price. So I think you'll see that again. You start seeing these discrepancies where you call up the gold dealer and gold's at, you know, for an example, $2,500 an ounce, but the futures price is $2,425. Or, well, let me give a better example. It's $2,500 an ounce and gold is at uh, $2,100 an ounce. So well, why the $400 spread? I mean, your normal markup's 4% is because, well, I don't know what the futures market's doing. All I know is that's what I'm going to accept. And I think you'll see that manifest as probably a good indicator, but time will tell. I'm not um, you know, certain how on wine. Again, it will, and when is very tough to uh, state. Asset allocation, what to own. Um, I'm an Irish Morgan Report subscriber. I highly recommend it. What percent physical do you recommend I hold as a core investment if I were to take profit over the next move to, say, 48 per ounce? What time this year do you expect to see the price reach? Okay. First of all, as a Morgan Report subscriber, there is a section called How to Use the Morgan Report. In that, How to Use the Morgan Report, which everyone should read when they first subscribe, and very few do, I give a few examples of what allocation you would have. So, in other words, I'm a precious metals investor. I have, I'm this old. I have this kind of net worth. And I give some hypotheticals. I give a couple of examples. And uh, my goals are X, and here's what you, here would be the recommendation. It'd be this much in physical, this much in top tier stocks, this much in the mid tier stocks we recommend, and this much in the speculative section that we recommend. Uh, you don't want to, you, you know, you're this age and you don't, are not interested in trading, so, you know, get the basics first and, and, you know, continue on. Uh, so there's some recommendations there, but I will answer it. In a general way, what's basically already written in for our paid members only, which means you'll get a better answer than I'm about to give you off the cuff. Every time I do this, you've got to realize that I can't speak in the amount of time allotted what it's taken me you know, a long time to write out in a PDF file. But basically, uh, it's your uh, age is the main consideration. Your, your net worth is somewhat of a consideration, and your goals, of course, are a consideration as well. But generally speaking, the physical amount you have should go up with age. In other words, you should have probably more leverage in the market, which means mining shares in your 30s and 40s than you would in your 70s and 80s. And the reason being is that you have a chance to make it back when you're younger that you don't have when you're older. So you have to be more conservative. There's nothing more conservative in the world than owning physical precious metals. It is the most conservative money that exists. The reason being is there's been money for over 5,000 years and will continue to be money no matter what any government anywhere says. That's what it is. That's what it's always been. And that's what, it, in my view, always will be. So if you're worried about you know, the stock market or the housing market or whatever is going on, certainly uh, you're entitled to your opinions on anything. But the fact is, that if you're really a conservative person, you want conservative money, money that stands the test of time. Uh, does that, not, that does not mean the price doesn't fluctuate. But think about that for a minute as well. If you had 10 ounces at the beginning of the year 2000, you have 100 ounces now, you're by definition, and my, and you really by definition, 10 times richer. And the reason is you have 10 times more ounces of silver. Now, the price will be different. And that's what everyone concerns themselves with because the price fluctuates. And this is part of the game in a way because it gets you to think, oh, my God, if I had to sell now. Now, I understand there are people that have to sell. I understand that there are people that take more leverage than they should. I understand all these things. I've been there. But nonetheless, if you really can get away from their paradigm and move into your paradigm and start thinking, all I want to do is accumulate ounces, I'm not concerned about the price. Because when are you going to sell? If you do it right and you do what you can afford and you do it over time, you're going to sell when you want to sell or when it's highly overvalued. Or you have a goal to pay off your house cash or send your daughter to college or buy that new car or start that business or 
uh, donate and start a charity or start a foundation. I don't know. I mean, I'm pro-people. I'm for you doing what you want to do with your money. But nonetheless, that's the idea. So moving on to the next question. What would be the smartest approach into investing in silver as a beginner? I Unfortunately, you don't have the program Silver Saver or uh, Silver123.net that's only available for uh, Canadians and, uh, and uh, Americans <coughs> to invest in. But I would say, you know, if you're not on the free part of the website, which you can just go to silver-investor.com and go to the bottom and sign up for the free e-reports. It's come out every week. I have to pay for them. It's my time, and that's fine. I don't mind doing it. It's a public service. Uh, in you get the ten rules of silver investing, and in the ten rules of silver investing, it tells you how to approach the market, especially as a beginner. So my approach would definitely be to dollar cost average. Don't try to pick a bottom, especially if you're new. Um, just take an attitude of you want to accumulate over time. I don't think it's uh, too late at all. I think, in fact, this is a good entry point. If you missed it at 5, 10, 15, and 20, I think you're fine to start buying under 30. And um, if I'm wrong and it goes below the 26 level and you've decided you're going to put in uh, you know, 10,000, uh, uh, and you spread that out over six months or even better a year. Uh, if it got there, you would just buy your uh, your amount that you've allocated and continue on. So it's a great approach to to a market. Plus, it takes a lot of the emotion out. Um, I will be receiving a substantial amount of capital in May on this year, and I want I was going to buy a new car, but I'm thinking about investing around 90% of these funds in the silver. Is this a good idea, and if so, why? Well. These are individual questions. I mean, if you're doing a consultation with me on the phone on that question, what I would say is, you know, what means the most to you? I mean, there's more to life than money. I mean, if the new car is something that you really, really want, and it's something that's going to bring you so much joy, I don't have a joy meter that I can put on you and measure your enjoyment. I mean, if that's something that was this, oh, this is the greatest thing that ever, uh, that's ever happened to me. I just turned 60. I've only had a few new cars in my life. I happen to have a new diesel Volkswagen, one of the highest rated, I think, environmental-wise. I love it. It's turbocharged. It does a nice job. It gets great mileage. But you know, cars to me are transportation. I obviously bought one that I thought would uh, probably be the last car I ever need. You know, diesels go forever. But to me, the newness of something usually wears off fairly quickly. But you know, I may be much older than you, so I don't know the answer. You really have to ask. You know, especially if you put in most of these funds in the silver and it sits there for another six months or a year. And gee, you got a year you could have driven this new car. So I really couldn't answer that for you. I just hopefully gave you some ideas to, to consider. And um, Michael, is that the end of the questions? Well, David, if I may, um, can I just draw your attention to these three questions? Absolutely. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. This is one that's a very touchy subject. Uh, first of all, I will give you my opinion. What I'm going to say is opinion only. Uh, there are other opinions on my website because I am free market and I value all opinions. Uh, because opinions are, are valid, but facts are Trump opinions, but we don't know, because we don't know the future. I live in the UK, we'll so we'll be confiscated. confiscated. I, I highly doubt it. First of all, to confiscate silver would be very difficult, because what do you confiscate? Only the monetary silver? Do you confiscate the silverware? Do you confiscate the silver silverware? How about all of the... Uh, reflective surfaces and all the skyscrapers around uh, the United Kingdom, particularly in London. I don't see it, but again, that's my opinion, and it's a strong one. If you look at, again, Charles Savoy's work in our archive section of the website, he has a different opinion. He feels that it will be. I don't. I really don't see it. Uh, second question, what are your perspective thoughts on the chances of silver gold confiscation in the USA? Again, I don't see it. Uh, but I do see it possibly being highly taxed. I believe between the two metals that gold would have a higher chance of being confiscated, although I doubt it will be confiscated. The reason being is that central banks still hold gold. They still, whether they admit it or not, gold is a monetary asset to a central bank. It is, and it's that way to the Federal Reserve as well. So because of that fact, chances, if there were to be a confiscation, I think it would be far more 
likely to be gold than silver. But again, they would be admitting that gold is money when they've been you know, preaching forever that gold isn't money. Even Bernanke said it was tradition. It wasn't money. When Ron Paul asked him if it's gold money, he said, no, no, it's not. It's a, it's a tradition. Well, it's money. But he didn't want to admit it or, or really thinks it's just a tradition. So again, I doubt it. Um, it's possible. I don't worry too much about it. If you are worried about it, then you need to either keep it in a jurisdiction that is safe from that, which uh, my friends here at Gold Corps will be explaining later in this presentation. So that's a consideration. What I teach is basically get it. it depends on your wealth. I mean, if you're, you know, you got, uh, and this is the idea. I'm not trying to. I do not judge people by how much money they have. I'm far better than that. So are you. But nonetheless. If you have a higher asset base, then you should consider owning it in probably three different jurisdictions. If you're of modest uh, means and your savings are more modest, then having it in one jurisdiction is probably all you can do, and then just you know take your luck where you're at or whatever. So hopefully I'm addressing that. So the last question, what are your views of confiscation of gold and silver in the United States becoming collapse of dollar? Really already addressed that. The government is not all powerful. They would like you to believe that. They'd like you to believe that the rights come from them and not from our creator. They would like you to believe a lot of things. But history has shown time and time again that the people really have the power and that even though they might edict this and edict that. I'll go back to, uh, to the gold confiscation in the 30s which is considered to be a nationalization. You were paid for your gold. It's just after the gold was collected that they changed the price. So it would be like buying a car from you and then all of a sudden up in a price by a substantial amount. Um, John Exter, who was a New York Fed banker, big gold bug, said, and he's long gone, but you can look up John Exter in uh, Google and maybe read this. I'm not sure. He said a lot of people did not, did not, turn in their gold during the 30s. They basically took it, stuck it in the coffee can, buried it outside their kitchen window where they could watch it while the women were doing the dishes, which weren't dishwashers in those days, and the women uh, not being degrading the women. It's just the, the time and place and condition that they spent a lot of time. So a lot of, uh, a lot of people didn't turn it in. I'm not suggesting you do or you don't. I'm suggesting that I doubt it would happen, and even if it does, then you have to make a decision what's best for you. Um, you know, Big Brother is watching us all in this uh, current climate, and this is a time for people to really find their metal, M-E-T-T-L-E, and determine what's valuable to them. To me, liberty is more valuable than any amount of precious metals, because if we lose our freedom, then it doesn't matter how much gold you've got. And uh, I think I'll wrap it up with that statement. David, thank you very, very much. I'm, I'm just going to scoot forward. I want to thank you. Uh, wow, we covered a lot of ground. I, I want to ask you once more, just repeat the, the URL. Is it Mises.org? Yes, M-I-S-E-S.org. M-I-S-E-S.org. Okay, I, I do think that a number of our listeners will find that a very valuable resource. Well, David, listen, thanks a million. Um, I, I, I know that we're going to get positive feedback, as we always do when we have a webinar with, your, with yourself. You're a very informed um, uh, visitor um, on this webinar, and I'd like to thank you for your time. My pleasure. Thank you.